Good evening, everybody. Thanks a lot for joining us tonight for a very special webinar for Fleet Feet Pittsburgh. want to thank Deb uh, for helping us put this together and uh, really excited to chat with a lot of you folks tonight um, about a lot of uh, fun topics, nutrition, marathon training, training for your race. Uh, we've got a lot to cover and hopefully we can keep this pretty informative for you. My name is Varun Sriram. I'll be your host tonight, joined by Michelle Hearn, registered dietitian, a wealth of knowledge, a runner, a marathoner herself, uh, quite a fast marathoner as well. Uh, Michelle, what is, uh, what is your PR? Uh, my PR is 308.26, and I'm uh, going for sub three at my next marathon, May 31st. There you go. Well, Michelle, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, excited to have you along as always. Thank you. So I think... Um, we're certainly going to talk here about you can and, and talk about how to use it in your training. But, you know, we always like to start these sessions off um, with just an overall discussion of nutrition and and the way that um, you want to think about certain nutrition concepts uh, and the way these concepts affect the way energy is delivered to your body. So we want to start there. And before we do that, I, I do want to add that, um, you know, for, for joining this webinar tonight, for everybody who's signed in and, and is listening in, you will be able to pick up a free sample packet of UCAN at Fleet Feet Pittsburgh, and um, that sh that'll be available for pickup at the end of the week. So, um, you know, we uh, by Friday. So, we really do appreciate you guys tuning in. And um, for those of you that haven't tried UCAN, you know, this will hopefully be a, a good chance to learn a little bit about the product and also get a chance to uh, to try a packet. And you know, we like to keep these uh, very interactive. I mean, we're here um, to talk about certain concepts with you, but but most of all, we're here as a resource to to help answer any of your questions. So if you uh, have the webinar applet open, uh, you will see there is a questions tab uh, over there. And feel free to type your questions in, the, in there and, and send them over to us. Michelle and I will both be able to see them. And we will make sure that we address um, all of your questions along the way. So with that, um, let's get started. Um, the first thing we want to really address is this idea of blood sugar. What is blood sugar and why should we care about keeping our blood sugar stable. And, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. Before I was uh, wrapped up in this whole world of nutrition and whole world of you can, when I heard the term blood sugar as, you know, as a, a person in their late 20s who, who keeps active and, and considers themselves relatively fit, I always thought to myself, I don't need to care about blood sugar. You know, I don't have diabetes. Blood sugar and managing blood sugar is only something that people with diabetes really should think about. Um, Michelle, how wrong was I? <laughs> well, I think uh, I think what you're thinking is something that um, you know most people, especially most healthy people in their 20s, uh, that's kind of what they think. They think you know if, if I'm not diabetic, then it's really not that important to me. But it really, truly is important to everybody. So. What is blood sugar? I mean, blood sugar is simply the amount of glucose that's in our bloodstream or the amount of, it's very simple, the amount of sugar in our bloodstream. But more importantly is why should we care about keeping our blood sugar stable? So when your blood sugar is stable, everything works better. That's when your your mind is very uh, focused and sharp. That's when, um, you know, your muscles are going to function really efficiently and effectively. Like let's say when you're going for a run, when your blood sugar is very stable, you're going to be able to keep a very steady, solid pace. Also, your blood sugar, depending on whether it's high or whether it's in the level correct range or whether it's low, it depends on what type of fuel your body is going to be burning. So that's something, you know, we're going to talk about as we go through this webinar. But um, keeping blood sugar in the ideal range or in the very um, level or stable range is, you know, is important for everybody. It also helps um, keeping your blood sugar stable, helps protect us from disease. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of people don't really get to learn about blood sugar until they actually have a problem with it. So, you know, this is awesome that you guys are learning about this now because not only can it help your athletic performance, but it can help keep you healthy. So what's interesting uh, when we look at blood sugar in this next slide is that um, you started alluding to this a little bit uh, earlier uh, just you know, with that last slide, Michelle, but a lot of the foods that as runners, um, you know, we've been taught to consume, whether it's uh, sports nutrition or, or whether it's uh, carbohydrate based foods actually um, don't impact our blood sugar ideally in, in terms of um, in terms of maintaining a steady rate of energy, in terms of blocking fat, uh, in, ter uh, sorry, it's in terms of burning fat, I should say. And in also, you know, just in terms of, of the things you talked about where keeping a steady level of blood sugar um, long-term is, is beneficial to preventing certain diseases. So 
things like bagels, bananas, you know, cereal, oh, uh, the, you know, things I like to o- often refer to as, as runner foods, things that runners have traditionally been taught that they should consume to fuel, uh, to fuel themselves prior to exercise, in a lot of cases may actually have a negative effect um, on energy. So, Michelle, w- uh, walk us through this graph. What are we looking at over here? Yeah, so let me talk to you what you're, about, what you're looking at. So um, you can see this initial spike. This is the, the spike in the red. So we can think about this as somebody who's just had, let's say, a bagel or you know, banana, one of those high carbohydrate, high glycemic foods, which we, you know, traditionally, that's what in sports nutrition, we've taught athletes, like you need to have these high carbohydrate foods before you work out because you need these carbohydrates. But what happens when you have these high carbohydrate foods is they empty from your stomach very quickly and the uh, enzymes in your intestines attack them and they cause this spike in blood glucose. What happens when you, uh, your blood glucose spikes, as you can see here, not only are you gonna have some GI distress, but when your blood glucose spikes really high, there's a hormone called insulin that comes in. Now insulin is a hormone that tells your body, burn all these sugars, don't burn fat. So basically by having those high carbohydrates before you work out, you're basically telling your body, you basically turn off fat burning. You can see here it says blocks fat oxidation. Another way to think about that is you basically stop uh, burning fat. You stop using fat um, for energy and your body is dependent on sugars. Then unfortunately what happens after that, your body is dependent on sugar. So then you're going to crash down low. When you crash down low, um, if you're doing a long run, a lot of us have probably experienced this doing uh, very, really long runs. If you don't refuel, you start to feel kind of dizzy, kind of shaky, maybe a little bit sweaty. So what do you have to do? You have to refuel with more sugars, either the goos or gels or other things, and then you're going to spike again. But when you crash, not only are you going to feel fatigued, you might feel hungry, but a lot of other things happen in your body. Um, Your body releases some stress hormones called cortisol, also epinephrine. Um, Your body can also release a hormone called ghrelin, which makes you feel really hungry and also really uncomfortable. And your your, your body doesn't want to keep its blood sugar stable. So when your blood sugar gets low, um, it's a very stressful state for your body. It's not something your your um, your body likes to experience. So, you know, I think one of the things that you you mentioned with with the idea of insulin and and fat burn, uh, which we'll get into in more detail in a little bit. Uh, one of the ways to think about it as well is, uh, you know, your body ideally always wants to burn fat, but like Michelle said, when you introduce an excess of sugar, you know, that rapid release of sugar, whether it's from you know a sugar based gel, a sports nutrition product, or these high carb, high glycemic um, carbohydrates that, that we, we were alluding to. Uh, another way to think of it is the body says, I have all this sugar in my blood, burn that sugar first, don't burn fat. Because even though the body wants to burn fat, when there's too much sugar in your system, uh, the body almost goes into a uh, uh, shock mode and says, let me fight this, get the sugar out of my system, let me burn it, uh, burn it away as soon as possible. And, and that's, again, what Michelle is alluding to, rather than burning that fat, which is what, um, you know, for a lot of reasons, uh, whether it's body composition, whether it's performance, um, you really want to be able to burn fat during exercise. You're relying solely on those sugars and your body's burning primarily those sugars. Um, this is something we'll certainly revisit um, just in a, in a couple moments as we get through a few more slides. So let's take a look. Um, you know, we talked about some of those those foods, but let's take a look at a lot of the uh, traditional sports nutrition out there. Um, What's their carbohydrate source? You look at some of the early um, sports nutrition products, the first ones on the market, uh, they're using what are alluded to as simple sugars, fructose, sucrose. Um, That's what you see in a lot of the the first sports nutrition products that hit the market. Then as as nutrition evolved um, and the the newer products came out on the market, the gels, some of the chews, some of the different powders. They started using uh, primarily a carbohydrate called maltodextrin, which um, you know, if you, you name the product, you flip uh, flip around the ingredient label, and and for almost all of them, the first carbohydrate you're going to see is maltodextrin. So, what is maltodextrin? It's a complex carbohydrate, but it still enters your system quickly. It, it causes that blood sugar spike, and it puts you on that blood sugar roller coaster. Again, you know, what goes up must come down. You have that spike and then 30 to 40 minutes later when you have the drop, you need to fuel with the maltodextrin-based product again. And, you know, this, um, for a lot of you folks who have experienced fueling with gels, the reason that you're taking a gel every 30 minutes, uh, for some people, you know, give or take 10 minutes, some it's 20, some it's 40, but the reason you're taking the gel at those relatively frequent intervals is because, um, like Michelle said, you need to 
take it to get your blood sugar back up because when you have that crash and you start to feel the fatigue, um, the, the gel gives you that shot again. But it's not really the ideal way to fuel. Um, you know, the, we talked about a, a whole bunch of the issues when you get locked into fueling that way in terms of fat burning, uh, just in terms of, um, you know, the, the stress hormones that the blood sugar highs and lows cause your body to produce. Um, and, you know, also when you're consuming so many calories throughout a workout, um, it's really leaves you prone to GI issues. You know, you have to keep on putting in so much and over the course of a marathon, you know, four five, six, even as many as eight gels, I've heard people tell me they take during the marathon, uh, at, at some point, um, you know, you may be like one of the lucky ones with an iron stomach, but for a lot of people at some point, taking in all those calories throughout the run really um, wreaks havoc on their stomach. So the idea actually with maltodextrin, uh, really quick, um, you know, when it, when it first came out on the market in a lot of sports nutrition products, um, it was a complex carbohydrate. And um, basically when uh, it's a complex carbohydrate, it, it's, um, it's got a higher molecular weight. So why does this matter? Large molecules are generally easier on the stomach. They pass through the stomach rapidly. Uh, smaller molecules, like simple sugars, sit in your stomach, exert pressure on your on your stomach, and, and pull water in. And that's a lot of times what causes those GI issues. So, maltodextrin, when it came out, uh, you know, was certainly an improvement over simple sugars in terms of the GI issues because it was a larger molecule. It was more complex carbohydrate, and therefore passed through the stomach quicker than sugars. Um, however, like we talked about, still had um, the, that same impact on, on blood sugar where it was giving you that that quick hit, that, that rush of calories, that rush of energy and causing those highs and lows. Um, so we've got that background and um, let's transition a little bit to UCAN now and, and kind of talk about how UCAN allows you to think about fueling your body in a, a totally different way. So what you're looking at on the screen right now is Jonah, who's the son of one of our co-founders. And Jonah had a very rare blood sugar disease. So we've talked about blood sugar. The way we all sleep at night is our liver slowly uh, releases glucose uh, into our bloodstream. And basically when we're sleeping at night, we get that steady release, almost like a glucose drip. We're able to maintain blood sugar and keep it very steady throughout the night. Now, kids like Jonah, they had a, a rare genetic defect where their liver was unable to break down stored carbohydrates and convert them into glucose. So um, they would get what's known as hypoglycemia, the very, very low blood sugar in the middle of the night. And um, you know, this was, in a lot of cases, life-threatening for these kids. It would cause seizures. Um, you know, when your blood sugar is extremely low, like Michelle said, you get dizzy um, and you know, it's, um, it, it really, they weren't able to sleep through the night. What would happen when they consume traditional carbohydrates is that because they entered their body so quickly, like we've talked about, the liver was unable to break down these carbohydrates fast enough. So they would all kind of get backed up and stockpiled in their liver and their livers would enlarge. But, you know, like we just said, the flip side is when they wouldn't consume carbohydrates uh, or, or they, you know, they would consume a smaller amount of carbohydrate that wouldn't break down. Uh, or it wouldn't, um, their liver couldn't break it down at the rate they needed it to, to maintain blood sugar throughout the night. So basically, um, in the seventies and eighties, these kids were dying at infancy in the nineties. They found that feeding these kids regular cornstarch, the Argo cornstarch that you can find at the grocery store, uh, because cornstarch broke down slower than a lot of other carbohydrates, these kids were able to be fed cornstarch at two hour intervals, uh, around the clock day and night, their parents were feeding them tube feeding them cornstarch every two hours. And this, uh, because it had a slower burn, was able to maintain their blood sugar for two hours at a time. Now, this is kind of a band-aid to the, to the problem because, you know, waking up every two hours for these families um, throughout the night, setting multiple alarm clocks, certainly not sustainable or ideal long term. There, there's actually a fascinating documentary on YouTube um, that features Jonah and his family and, and several other families. Um, who have kids with this condition called life by the clock. And it basically talks about these parents setting multiple alarm clocks um, throughout the night and, you know, making sure they woke up every two hours to feed their child. Um, so Jonah's family, you know, they were really proactive and they basically said, we want to find a carbohydrate, the best carbohydrate in the world. Now, 
how did they define the best carbohydrate in the world? They basically wanted something that would break down very slowly over time and something that they could feed their child a significant dose of prior to him sleeping at night and it would just trickle in and basically give him little bits of energy over time and keep his blood sugar stable throughout the night. So that way, you know, Jonah and kids like Jonah wouldn't have this life-threatening low blood sugar while they were sleeping and the families wouldn't have to wake up every two hours to feed their child. So early 2000, Jonah's family, they they started a a foundation and they basically were uh, funding research uh, looking for the best carbohydrate. They went to the uh, University of Scotland where there were some of the top carbohydrate researchers in the world and and they had these uh, individuals look at all carbohydrate sources, rices, tapiocas, barleys, wheats, you know, different kinds of starches, potato starch. Uh, and eventually what they found was that when you start with non-GMO cornstarch, non-GMO meaning not genetically modified, and you put it through a very specific cooking process, just cook it with heat and water, but, but you know, the way it's cooked is specific and it's, and it's actually cooked over a 40-hour period of time. This would actually allow the carbohydrate, it would, elo- it would change the molecular structure, it would elongate the carbohydrate and allow it to break down very, very slowly, basically providing Jonah and these kids with little bits of energy over time and helping them maintain their blood sugar throughout the night. Um, so that's really, that's really where this carbohydrate that we, we at UK and we call it super starch now, that's where super starch came about. And um, you know, super starch, uh, like we said, it's based on patent science that, that cooking technology is very specific. So you wouldn't be able to just go to the grocery store and say, let me just, um, you know, heat up some cornstarch. It, it just wouldn't break down as slowly and produce the same effect. Um, the cooking process, it is all natural. It's just cornstarch, heat and water, no chemicals, no enzymes. Um, because remember the, the people that this was created for were, young babies. So it had to be a very natural uh, carbohydrate for these babies to be able to take it. The corn is non-GMO, not genetically modified. It's, it's gluten-free. And again, it's you know been tested in a clinical atmosphere. So that's basically where super starch, the carbohydrate in UCAN came about. Um, we knew that it was good for Jonah and, and kids with this disease. And then kind of the inkling started coming along that how else, uh, you know, who else needs to maintain their energy levels for a long period of time, um, you know, without, uh, without wanting to keep fueling over and over again? Uh, well, it turns out that that's athletes, you know, whether it's endurance athletes or, or you know, team sports athletes. Um, and, and there's actually significantly more implications uh, of maintaining blood sugar, steady blood sugar for a long period of time. But that's really where we launched into sports nutrition. Um, some of the top sports dietitians started getting wind of our research and, uh, and you know, we, we reached out to several of them and said, you know, we've got this carbohydrate and we think it could be very applicable for sports and for endurance athletes, but, you know, tell us um, what you think, basically. Tell us if you think this will work. So really one of the first guys to test this out um, was a gentleman by the name of Bob Sibahar. He was the, in 2008, he was the dietitian at the University of Florida, and he was actually the uh, sports dietitian for the U.S. Olympic triathlon team. So Bob said, you know, if, if this carbohydrate does what you say it does, if it maintains blood sugar on its own for a long period of time without needing to refuel, this is going to change my profession. This is going to change the way we think about fueling for exercise. Um, simultaneously, another guy that was trying it out uh, – by the recommendation of a sports dietitian was Meb Kaflesgi, who many of you may know. Meb's a, a three-time U.S. Olympian and has been the top marathoner in the U.S. for the last decade. And and Meb was also reaching a stage uh, in his life, um, you know, as he was um, getting up there in age in his early third. I say getting up there in age, but I guess in in all relative terms, a, a, as an athlete um, in his early thirties, was struggling with the traditional sugar-based fuel sources and was looking for something that. Could maintain him for a longer period of time. So, you know, on the recommendation of his nutritionist, Meb started uh, testing out this carbohydrate as well. And, and, you know, eventually we launched into sports nutrition in 2010 at the Boston Marathon um, with Meb. And, uh, you know, after uh, several athletes had, had tested it and, and really liked the effect that they felt. And that's the deal with UCAN. You know, it's, it's, there's a science aspect to it, but there's also the way it makes you feel, which is something we're going to talk a lot more about here in a second. Um, But 
you know, before we launched the sports nutrition, we basically wanted to test our carbohydrate, our super starch, um, which we just talked about what it is. We wanted to test it against maltodextrin because as I mentioned previously, maltodextrin was at the time the best carbohydrate on the market. It was what all the newer sports nutrition products were using. So we thought to ourselves, you know, let's make sure that what we've got, um, you know, does something different or, or does something better than maltodextrin. Uh, Michelle, why don't you kind of take us through this slide where uh, we detail the difference between the way super starch and maltodextrin both act in the body? Yeah, absolutely. And so also something else to think about, maltodextrin is the number one um, uh, ingredient in most sports for, uh, formulas. So if you take goose or gels or a lot of the um, you know, various uh, carbohydrate supplements out there, recovery formulas, they do have maltodextrin as their main ingredient. So look in the blue. So the blue is maltodextrin. So when you take in maltodextrin, what happens is your blood glucose spikes. And remember what we talked about in the beginning of this um, you know, webinar, that what happens when your blood glucose spikes is insulin comes in. And insulin's a hormone that basically tells your body, burn all these carbohydrates, don't burn fat. So it doesn't allow your body to utilize fat. So now you're um, basically dependent on burning carbohydrates. Then you're going to have a subsequ subsequent drop. And then you're going to have to, once again, you're going to have to redose every 30, maybe 40 minutes. And you've kind of put your um, body in that state where you're, um, it's dependent on burning sugars. So now super starch, super starch is really neat because you can, you can see here when you take it, there's a very, very, very small insulin response, a muted insulin response. And uh, you're going to have that steady, consistent energy all the way up to three and a half hours. And what's really neat about that, too, is it teaches your body to burn and utilize fat. And like Byron was talking about, um, it goes beyond just the body composition aspect. When you're burning fat, you're going to feel really good. The more you use you can, the more um, you train your body to burn fat. And so you're going to have that consistent energy when you run. It's really neat to be able to um, you know, line up for a race or even a hard workout and know that you're going to feel the same at the beginning of your workout um, or at the end of your workout as you do at the beginning, which is totally different than, you know, when you're using a lot of those, those sugar-based products, you're usually pretty wiped out by the end of your workouts. So if we look at just one more um, graph and then we'll, we'll move on a little bit from the science into some practical uh, usage uh, of UCAN and, and the best way to train with it. But I think we do want to kind of highlight um, all the things that we've talked about to, to just give you an understanding of, you know, why this is different. I always, I always joke to people that, um, you know, the, what the product does is better than, than the marketing. You know, there, this is, I, I think, um, understanding how you can and how this carbohydrate works compared to other carbohydrates is important um, to kind of give you the, the information to make your own informed decision about how you want to fuel. But, um, you know, suffice to say, this is behaving very, very differently in your body. So it's not just about um, you know, mixing up the ratios and, and using something that everybody else is using. I mean, I mean, this is truly a carbohydrate that behaves completely differently. Um, so Michelle had talked about this hormone insulin. And again, if you look at this graph, um, as you can see, uh, and I should add this, this was a clinical trial done at the University of Oklahoma back in 2008. And basically, um, we took racing team cyclists, very fit individuals, and um, gave them maltodextrin prior to them getting on the bike for three hours, 30 minutes before, and we gave them super starch 30 minutes before getting on the bike. Now, this each of the cyclists did this test on two separate occasions, and it was a double-blinded study, meaning the people that were administering the test didn't know which carbohydrate they were giving the cyclists. The cyclists themselves didn't know which carbohydrate they were taking. So, you know, this was to eliminate the, the placebo effect. If they perceived they were taking something better, um, you know, things might have changed uh, in their mind or, or the way they push themselves or all that. Um, and if you remember that from the previous graph, um, just scroll back to it really quickly. If you look at the blue line when blood sugar spikes, and now you look at this graph, insulin spikes. And like Michelle said, you know, insulin is a hormone. It's, it's a very sensitive hormone, and it's a hormone that tells the body to store fat. Anytime you have the sugar spike, you get that spike in insulin. If you look at the red line here, because you can never causes that spike in blood sugar, it causes virtually no uh, reaction from this hormone insulin. This is a very, very unique feature of a carbohydrate. Actually, uh, out of all the findings in our research, what the nutrition experts found most significant was that there's finally a carbohydrate that doesn't cause an insulin response. It's a carbohydrate that allows your body to freely burn fat. So, you know, you may, uh, for those of you who are 
um, you know, into nutrition or, or a little bit more familiar with the science, uh, you may uh, have been familiar with this notion that carbohydrates block fat burn. Um, it's a lot of the reason why people who are trying to lose weight, um, often it's recommended that they go on a controlled or lower carb diet because a lot of carbohydrates affect fat burn. So even though by the technical definition, this is considered a carbohydrate, it's, it's a very, very unique carbohydrate because it's a carb that allows the body to freely burn fat. Just point out one more thing on this graph, and then I actually want to put up a poll uh, to, to get an understanding of uh, the audience we have here today. But if you look at that second um, green line, uh, we also have the cyclists take the maltodextrin and the super starch after exercise in, in the recovery window. And again, you can see that um, the blue line, the maltodextrin, caused the rise in insulin, and the UCAN again kept insulin relatively stable, uh, meaning that you know when you use UCAN, Post workout, you know, you can paired with protein post workout. Again, you're keeping blood sugar stable, you're keeping insulin low, and you're allowing your body to continue burning fat in that post workout window, which is such a incredible time to burn fat. But but you know, let's let's think what happens a lot of times when we're done with a hard workout. You know, you may have chocolate milk, 25 grams of sugar. What happens then? Blood sugar rises, insulin rises. The body says, burn sugar, don't burn fat. You may have, you know, you may carb load after a tough workout, whether it's with, with pastas or rice or bread, same deal, you know, or if you're having a, a traditional carb protein drink with, you know, 15 to 20 grams of maltodextrin, the same thing is happening. And, and it's actually fascinating. You know, that's why um, you, you may or may not be able to relate to this personally, but I can't tell you how many people I've had at various marathon expos who've come up to me and said, I've actually gained, you know, four or five pounds when I'm training for a marathon and I can't figure out why. And then... You kind of work backwards with them and, and they look at the way they've been fueling their workouts and, and they look at the nutrition they've been consuming after their workout and suddenly it makes total sense. You know, they're consuming so many carbohydrates to support their energy demands um, and they're not allowing their body to, to burn and access um, that incredible source of energy, which is, which is their fat. Because I should add that even if you're one of the lucky ones, you know, even if you're saying, I'm lean, I don't care one bit about burning fat from a body composition standpoint, which you know, I would guess most people who are training for an endurance event do have some type of body composition goal in mind, but there's certainly outliers who, who don't um, care about burning fat from, from a weight loss or an aesthetic um, sense. You still want to burn fat because it's an incredible source of fuel. A gram of carbohydrate provides you with four calories of energy. A gram of fat provides you with nine calories of energy. So the ideal, you know, it, you can almost think of it as a hybrid car. With, with, with you can, you're getting a steady release of carbohydrate that maintains your blood sugar and allows your body to tap into and burn fat. So you're actually getting two fuels versus when you spike your blood sugar and you're reliant on carbs, carbs, carbs throughout the exercise, you're really only using one fuel. And, you know, even the leanest people, med, let's we use the example of men, you know, Olympic marathon or 3% body fat, even Meb's got about 14,000 calories of stored fat that he could access and use for fuel. Um, so, you know, the rest of us significantly more. Uh, most of us can only store, um, you know, 2,000 or less uh, grams of carbohydrate. So it's much easier to deplete your carbohydrate stores. You're never going to deplete your fat stores. Um, so, you know, that's another thing to consider. The benefit of burning fat is that it's, it's, it's an excellent, powerful fuel source and it's a, a very abundant source of fuel. Um, so what I do want to do here now is uh, just take a, take a poll of the audience and see actually how many uh, of you have uh, given UCAN a try, how many of you have used the product before. So if you just want to uh, answer the poll on your screen, we can, we can uh, take a poll of the audience and see who's uh, been a UCAN user. Michelle, um, I'm always interested kind of in, in everybody's aha moment with UCAN. Uh, for, for you, uh, you know, do you remember when you first heard about the product and, and kind of what clicked in your mind that, that you, yeah yeah I certainly do I um I was on let's run.com just reading about some it was um a few years ago and I saw I believe it was Meb was an advertisement and I'm always interested in you know the science behind things so I went to the website and I looked at the science and I was and honestly I believe like no way there is no way you can take a carbohydrate and it not spike your blood sugar we've never seen anything like this in sports nutrition but I was just I was intrigued so of course you know I went ahead and just bought like a sample pack a six pack and I um, I've had issues with blood sugar you know I don't feel great when I take a lot of the goos 
And so I tried um, a packet before one of my easy runs and I felt great. And I said, oh, okay, well, you know, this is, it's, it, it's just probably a placebo. So I did it before a long run and it was the first time I'd been able to go an hour and a half without redosing. Like I brought a goo with me, but you know, I didn't use it. And I tried it before a track workout and I felt really good. And so that's when I was like, okay, there has to be something to this. Like I need to learn more about it. So um, yeah, I just, I, I can't say enough about it. I, you know, it's something that I can use I use it with all my running. I use it every day before I run. Like when you start your day with stable blood sugar, it just, it changes everything. You know, I'm able to not only run and do a really hard workout, you know, between 10 and 15 miles in the morning, but then I'm able to go into my work day with that stable blood sugar and stable energy. So it's a, it's truly, it's truly one of a kind too. I've had people ask me if there's knockoff, if there's anything else like it, but you know, this is, this is, it's a one of a kind, the super starch. So this is, uh, I'm always uh, intrigued to see what the uh, makeup of the audience is. And, um, you know, it looks like uh, a good chunk of you have never, have never used the product before. So we're going to get, get into usage here in a second. And then we've got um, kind of the rest of you span the gamut. You know, uh, some of you are very frequent users and some of you seem to have played around with it um, a little bit. Now, even for the folks that have used it a lot, I, I, don't, I, I do hope that taking a bit of a deep dive into the science was valuable um, because, you know, you may have used it and may have uh, thought to yourself, yeah, I, I feel pretty good, but uh, may not have necessarily known why you feel good. So, um, so I do assure you, it's not like Michelle said, it's not just placebo. There is uh, a lot more than a uh, placebo going on. So, uh, you know, kind of just to uh, quickly review some of the benefits that you can has to offer. I think, um, a lot of times when people hear about, um, you know, a product like this and, and, you know, we've talked about med as well, they, the, the question they often wonder is, you know, is this for me? Um, you know, am I, I'm not necessarily an elite athlete, uh, or, you know, I'm just getting into running. Why do I want this? So the, the, I really like to think of you can, um, kind of as having a benefit, um, to, you know, both the beginner runner and the competitive runner. And we, we like to talk about this with a little play on words. So, you know, if you're somebody that's running to win, how do we define running to win? You're, you're looking to, you know, really focused on improving your PR, um, you know, whatever level it's at, you you view yourself as a competitive runner. Um, you know, what do you want? You want something that's going to maintain your energy so you can perform. You really want to avoid that blood sugar crash um, because, you know, you don't want to have, your, your performance interrupted by the, the lulls in energy, you're looking for that, that sustained and steady energy. And, and also you're probably very sensitive to, to GI issues because, you know, nothing can derail a, um, and when I say sensitive, I mean, you're, you're very conscious of not wanting to have GI issues um, because, you know, nothing can derail performance faster than GI issues. Michelle, I would probably put you in this category of someone who's running to win. Um, you know, what have you felt like you can uh, impacted your performance? How has it impacted your performance? Oh my goodness. Um, it's, it's changed everything. You know, I used to, you know, start my runs with high carbohydrate food and I would have those spikes and crashes and you're just, it's almost, you know, during, during runs, you're trying to run as hard as you possibly can, but it's, there's so much to chance, you know, well, I hope this goo doesn't bother my stomach and I hope I can finish. I hope I don't get too dizzy. Um, where I don't, I don't have to worry about that anymore. I'm able to take a scoop of Ucan or two before my run and I can just run and I can just, in every run I start, I'm able to run with confidence that I'm going to feel good during my entire run. Like I don't have those highs and lows. Um, and you know, after using the product, I used to think when I first started using it, it was only something I would need for my longer runs, um, like 90 minutes or more. But when I learned that, you know, using it for even my shorter runs, it was going to start my day with um, that stable blood sugar and teach my body to be able to utilize fat. I now use it for every run before and after running. And it's uh, it's not only made my, my running faster and running more um, efficient, you know, I've taken time off my, uh, my 5K PR um, all the way up to my marathon PR. I was able to, you know, get down to um, under 18 in the 5K, so 1742, which is a 548 pace. And um, you know, I was fourth overall in the Seattle marathon and, uh, it's just, I mean, I can't say enough about it. And the fact that there's no GI distress, um, anybody who's ever had that in a race, it just, it truly does derail your race. I got really bad cramps at about mile 10 of a half marathon once it's, it's kind of like you have to struggle to the end. So, so we've got that segment of you and, uh, you know, the other, the other end of the, the spectrum is those of you who are running to lose and, uh, you are not at all losers just, uh, but running to lose means 
you're looking to, to you know, lose some weight, uh, you're running as a, as a way to get more fit. And, and really, um, you know, this, this is a lot of people that, that are just getting into to 5Ks or 10Ks. But, but even, you know, nowadays, uh, you know, a lot of people jump straight into the marathon or half marathon and, and try to use it as an avenue to get more fit. And, and you know, those are really the people that um, oftentimes are, wonder to themselves, like we talked about before, you know, I'm training and running more than I ever have in my life. Why the heck am I not losing weight? And again, it's, it's because of the, the foods that you've been and, and nutrition that you've traditionally been taught that you need as an endurance runner. So how you can benefit you. We, we, we certainly talked about um, the idea that it's going to allow the body to burn more fat for fuel because when your blood sugar is stable and your insulin is low, the body's able to tap into and burn fat. When you're doing your, your run or your long run, you need significantly less external calories, meaning you're, you're consuming a lot less to, to get you through that run because you're able to tap into and and burn fat. So, so this isn't something where, um, you know, it, it, it's not magic, right? So you're not replacing, you, you know, 300 calories of gels with 100 calories of Yukon and just magically um, still able to have the energy. There's really some science going on here. What's happening is that, you know, we've always thought of calories as what we consume because with traditional carbohydrates, the only uh, calories that our body's using for energy or the primary calories that our body's using for energy are, are calories that we consume. With UCAN, you're still using the same or, or similar number of calories. It's just um, you know, a lot more of those calories are coming from your fat. So you're able to burn more of your fat for fuel. And a big thing, Michelle, and you know, as a dietitian, you could talk about this. Um, a big thing that many people have told us and, and you know, I think I've experienced it um, myself is, you know, when I, even when I was running five, six miles and, and if it was, you know, un, running for under an hour, when I would be done with that run, when I was when I was having the banana before I ran, I would come home and I would just be starving. Um, and, you know, you come home and you're ravenous. What do you do? You certainly don't. For most people, sit down and cook yourself a salad. You reach into the fridge and, and grab whatever is quick and convenient. Um why does that happen when you're on that uh, on that blood sugar roller coaster? Why why do you feel so hungry? Well, what I, I call that zone when your blood sugar gets very low, I call that the I can't make good decision zone. And just like you alluded to, that's where you um you know you're really hungry and you go as opposed to you know going home or going wherever and having something very healthy. You um, tend to grab something that's either really high in sugar or high in fat. But um, yeah, I work, you know, I work with a lot of clients who their goal is to, or one of their big goals is they want to lose weight. They might have a goal of, you know, finishing event, but they definitely want to lose um, body fat, whether it's a lot of people, you know, have the fat around their stomach or on their hips. So what's happening when you have a banana or you have something right before you work out, you know, you're spiking your blood sugar like we saw in the previous slides and then you're crashing your blood sugar. So you basically had a few options in order not to do that. So you could either run or work out in a fasted state which, you know, you're going to be burning more fat versus eating those carbohydrates. But, you know, what happens when you're working out in a fasted state is your blood sugar is going to decrease throughout your run. And, you know, towards the end of your run, you have two choices. You can either slow down because your blood sugar is, you know, low and you're not going to be feeling great. Or, um, you know, you just, you eventually had to stop. And as your blood sugar decreases, you know, like Byron was saying, you know, when you're done, you feel so hungry. Your body actually releases a hormone called ghrelin when you get into that really low blood sugar state. Um, and that hormone tells your brain, it says, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. So even though um, you may have, you may have only done a short run or you may have, um, you know, already taken in some calories, like you may have had a bagel or something before you ran, but because you spiked and crashed your blood sugar, your, your um, ghrelin is telling your, your brain that you need to eat more calories. So I worked with a lot of athletes that um, they can't lose weight. It's actually, it is quite fascinating to go to, you know, uh, triathlons or marathons and see so many people competing um, that have a lot of excess body fat. It, it truly is, you know, and I think that's interesting. I think if, if you've never been um, to, to a race before or you're not kind of in the endurance world, the, the perception that everyone has is that, you know, if you if you're doing a marathon or a or a triathlon, you, you must be very lean and very fit. But um, you know, not certainly not always the case. And um, and I think it's um, a lot of times just because people might be misinformed about what they need. So let's talk about you know we, we talked a lot of, of conceptual things. Let's really talk about um, how we recommend using UCAN and how to make the product work for you. There's essentially two different versions. There's 
the sports drink mix and the protein drink mix. So the sports drink mix um, comes in four fruit flavors. There's an orange, which is our newest flavor. Um, been getting really good feedback about the taste of that. There's pomegranate, blueberry, lemonade, and cranberry raspberry. In the protein version, there's chocolate and vanilla, kind of your tradition protein, traditional protein flavors. Now, everything, all of these packets have, uh, and, and the product actually does come in both single-serve packets and tubs, but let's just think about the packets right now. All of these packets contain 30 grams of our super starch carbohydrates. So whether it's the sports drink mix or protein drink mix, you're still getting the super starch, which is, again, as we've talked about at length, really what sets you can apart. The sports drink mix, it's about 110 to 130 calories, depending on the flavor. It's got uh, a good amount of added electrolytes, about uh, 240 milligrams of sodium, about 140 uh, milligrams of potassium. So, um, you know, if uh, it's, it's very, very comparable to uh, the, the electrolyte content in a 12-ounce Gatorade, for example. How would you use it? The, the Really what you want to think about you can is – it's, it's a, a, actually, I, I should say this too, it seems obvious to me because we know the product, but uh, you can, it's a carbohydrate powder. So it's a powder that you mix with water and, and you drink it. Um, so really the way we recommend thinking of you can is don't, don't view it as a traditional sports drink that you kind of sip on slowly throughout exercise. You can is really a pre-workout snack. This is what you're having again, instead of the cereal, instead of the energy bar, instead of the banana. Instead of, you know, whatever your carbohydrate sports nutrition may be, this is what you're having 30 minutes prior to your exercise. In general, we say mix a packet with about 8 to 12 ounces of cold water, and you want to give it a very good shake. It's, it's not going to dissolve in water. So, um, you know, I would say don't spoon stir it, um, you know, and, and you really want to shake it, uh, shake it well to, to get it to mix as best as possible. And basically just try to consume it, you know, in that 20 to 30 minute window prior to your workout. Uh, it, it's very easy on the stomach. For, so for those of you that are early morning runners and generally don't fuel because, you know, you don't want to wake up early enough to, to have to eat a meal, um, you know, a lot of those folks have found a great benefit from you can. You know, even if you drink it, you know, five or ten minutes before you get out the door, um, that's fine as well. But, uh, you know, we just want you to think of, uh, we say 30 minutes before about because it breaks down slowly and we want you to think of it as a pre-workout snack. If you're going under two hours, um, for most people, a packet of UCAN 30 minutes before is really going to be all they need. You could certainly hydrate with water as you see fit. And, you know, if you want to, if it's really hot, if you're a heavy sweater and you just want to consume some sugar-free electrolytes along the way, you know, whether it's something like a Noon or, or, you know, a variety of other electrolyte products that are out there, you could certainly do that. But, but in terms of fuel, for that workout under two hours, for most people, you can going to take care of your fueling needs. And then this is kind of a, a different way we've seen people use it. Um, but you know, a lot of people two or three o'clock in the afternoon, instead of snacking, um, you know, on on a bag of chips or or you know, having a soda, having their third cup of coffee, they just all drink uh, you can at their desk at work. You know, a packet of you can just to, to give them that that steady. A few hours of energy, um, you know, throughout throughout the end of their workday, because you know, as Michelle's talked about so much, a lot of times when the blood sugar drops, your your brain is telling you that you're hungry, but in reality, um, you know, you're not actually hungry um, in that physical stomach sense of hunger. You just have low blood sugar, and and your mind is almost playing tricks on you. So, so you can really for for those of you that are trying to cut out that that midday snacking or that that midday low. Um, you can is something it's, it's not going to jack you up like, you know, a five hour energy or something. It's just something that's going to keep you nice and even and, and maintain you, um, throughout the, throughout the day. Michelle, how about the, uh, the protein drink mix? How do you, uh, recommend using that? And, and what's that all about? Let's see, Michelle, are you still with me? All right. Looks like Michelle may have dropped off for a second, but let's see if we can uh, let's see if we can get her back. But the uh, the protein drink mix. Um, so basically, um, from an energy perspective, you know, it still contains the 30 grams of the super starch. Uh, it's got 13 grams of added whey protein, and and it's got slightly higher caloric content, uh, about 180 to 200 calories, and it contains the electrolytes as well. So. 
um, you know, the, the protein uh, drink mix can certainly be used post-workout uh, for recovery. Um, you know, in general, um, the, the basically, you know, like we talked about before, using the super starch in the recovery window is very beneficial because it'll keep your energy and your blood sugar nice and stable, allow the body to continue to burn fat, and then the protein is designed to help your muscles recover. In terms of mixing it, uh, same deal, you know, pack it with about 8 to 12 ounces of cold water, give it a good hard shake. Um, and the, the protein drink mix is actually quite versatile because it does contain the super starch. So because it's going to maintain your energy levels, a lot of people who don't really like to eat breakfast prior to race actually use the protein you can as their breakfast. Um, the, the added protein, if you're not using it for recovery, it's, it's using it pre-workout. It's, it's designed to help curb hunger in the stomach. So if you're somebody that, um, you know, doesn't really like to eat much before a run, you may decide that using the UCAN with protein prior to a long run is, is better than better for you. Or if you're somebody that gets very hungry when you exercise, you know, um, then certainly the UCAN with protein is also will work very well uh, when you use it pre-workout. I, I always like to give this example, you know, l- let's look at a typical day. Let's say you ate lunch around 1230 or one and you're going to get out of work around five-ish, going to go head straight to the gym. It's been about four or five hours since you've eaten, um, for, for a lot of, um, so for a lot of people, you know, that, that feeling of hunger that you start to get, uh, oftentimes will just prevent you from working out. You'll say, oh, I'm too hungry to work out. So that, that may be a very good situation. Uh, if, if you're running, you know, in the evening after uh, a full work day and you haven't eaten in several hours and, and, you know, you still want to go home and eat your normal dinner after your workout, uh, then using the, you can with protein prior to that type of workout, um, maybe exactly what, what you need. And, and that may work very well for you. Um, from strictly an energy standpoint, we haven't really, uh, there's, there's no true difference where, you know, one gives you better energy than the other. So it's more to just think about, um, that, that issue of hunger when you're thinking uh, about which version of you can, you should use before. And, and, you know, some people, the protein mix is not at all heavy, but some people do prefer the sports drink mix before just because it is lighter on the stomach. It is, um, you know, both of them are easy on the stomach, but the sports drink mix, um, will will feel lighter because it's just um it's just less one final uh, point i just want to convey and then i do want to get to it that we have several questions i want to make sure we answer these um is in terms of the amount of water you use we recommend about eight to twelve ounces of water uh for for best taste that's what we found provides uh, the best taste and consistency but there's no set amount of water you have to use to make the product work so you know, in a lot of cases, let's say you're running first thing in the morning and you're having the you can right before you get out the door. A, a lot of times people like I'll, I'll just use four or five ounces of water and mix it up real thick and just, you know, almost take it like a gel or like a shot. Because if I'm drinking the you can right before I run, you know, 15, 20 minutes into my run, I don't want to have to go to the bathroom. Um, similarly, if, if you're somebody that kind of wants to sip on it more slowly and you want to have it a little more diluted, you could start drink, mix it with, you know, more water and start sipping on it an hour before and, and, you know, finish it over the span of 20 to 30 minutes. So the water is, is kind of just a general recommendation, but really uh, do what works best for you. Uh, Michelle, are you back with us now? Yeah, I am. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, no worries at all. So let's let's uh, get to a few questions. Let's see. We um, Tom asks us the benefits or drawbacks of using caffeine with UCAN. So what would you say, Michelle? Uh, what impact does caffeine have on blood sugar? And um, to your clients or for yourself, do you use caffeine with you can? Yes, I do. That's that's a good question. So, um, you know, there's a lot of research that says caffeine helps us uh, mobilize free fatty acids, be able to use more fat during working out. Um, than not using it at all. So I actually start my day, I usually start my day with a cup of coffee, you know, a cup of pretty strong brewed coffee and one to two scoops of the super starch. So they actually work really well in conjunction together because, you know, the UCAN is going to provide you that consistent energy and is going to be able to allow your body to burn fat where caffeine kind of, you know, wakes up your mind and gets you going and also is, um, can help your body utilize free fatty acids. So that's a, that's an excellent way to use UCAN. Uh, I, I do. I'm happy that uh, that Karen asked this question, which is uh, I think a question probably a lot of people have. Um, she says, "Let's see. Let me read this." She just said, oh, "I'm not sorry, not Karen. Um, this is actually Shelley's question." Shelley says, "It's recommended to fuel every five to six miles of a run with 20 grams of carbohydrate. Um, need about 100 grams of carbohydrate to fuel a full marathon. How do we get enough fuel from UCAN?" 
So, Shelly, this is, uh, you know, certainly a, a very logical and, and great question and probably one of the most frequent questions we get. And, you know, a lot of people who are, you know, a lot of those uh, tra- traditional carbohydrate recommendations were based on traditional carbohydrates. So, you know, we've talked at length about how um, with UCAN, you're not only getting fuel from carbohydrates, you're also able to tap into your own fat. So that's the deal with you can, you know, it's, it's, you don't need as many carbohydrates and you don't need to follow those traditional recommendations because you're able to tap into and burn fat and, and use fat for fuel. And, you know, that's certainly something that I can sit here and, you know, Michelle and I can sit here and, and, and tell you what, what the science of you can and, and the fat burning aspect of it says until we're blue in the face. But Obviously, um, you know, you, you're going to want to the, the true test case for you will be once you try the product and, and realize, wow, um, you know, I'm feeling with significantly less and feeling better um, than and performing better than I did when I was following those traditional guidelines. And, uh, you know, I did want to pull up this chart to kind of give you a perspective, because, um, you know, if, if you look at traditional recommendations, you know. Uh, for a run of about 90 minutes, uh, what what would people often do? You may have an energy bar prior to the run is kind of your pre-workout snack. And then you may sort of sip on a bottle of, of um, you know, X sports drink, whatever sports drink um, throughout your run to, to kind of maintain that energy. About 300 calories. A lot of times for a 90 minute run, people may take, you know, say three gels, one gel before one gel, maybe about the 30, 35 minute mark and another gel, you know, about a little over an hour to get them through again, 300 calories. So how is you 130 calories replacing that? Um, and you know, I really like this. I really like this, um, recommendation or not this uh, statement from Kathy Eckel, who's a, a researcher at Yale university. And she studies everything about the human metabolism. And, and what she says is, It's really the ability to maintain blood sugar that sustains energy levels. So from a fitness standpoint, UCAN is huge because it does that without putting calories on board. It's really beneficial because you can make every calorie count. Um, So Michelle, uh, you might be able to add a perspective on this, but when you're fueling with those fast acting carbohydrates, um, you know, is your body actually using all of those calories as energy? No, it's not. And I mean, that's another reason why, you know, we see with a lot of, um, you know, endurance athletes using a lot of those calories, they really um, have trouble losing weight or some people actually gain weight. But this is this has been the best uh, solution we've had, you know, for years was you had to continue to take in um, those high sugar uh, foods or drinks. That's why, you know, you watch sporting events, they're constantly on the sidelines, you know, uh, drinking Gatorade and runners are constantly either drinking those Gatorades or goos or gels or shot blocks. Um, but what's happening is, you know, we're just cr- spiking and crashing our blood sugar. We're not using all those carbohydrates or calories. We're just having to keep taking those sugars in so we don't go um, extremely hypoglycemic and have that really low blood sugar and then you end up hitting the wall. So, uh, Shelly, hope that answered uh, your question, but but you can definitely, um, you know, it does challenge a lot of those traditional recommendations, and I would say just, um, you know, you will have an opportunity to try it, and I think that's something that, you know, that you will feel and, and see for yourself. Uh, Michelle, I know you've got to, to leave us in about five minutes. I, I do want to let everyone know that I do see all your questions, and, you know, even when Michelle leaves us, I'm going to make sure to answer every single person's question. But, but while we do have you here, Michelle, let's, um, you know, we have a lot of folks that have, uh, uh, kind of the same type of similar question, which is, um, you know, should you still use gels, um, when you're using you can, and, and, you know, you can, we're, we're not at all saying one packet of you can is going to fuel you for a full marathon. So we have a lot of people asking, um, you know, how gels and you can interact together and what they should do during a marathon. I kind of want to just offer our very general recommendation and then I'll let you, um, you weigh in a little bit more. What sure. we found um, during the marathon is that generally a packet of you can, like we said, you know, lasts about 90 minutes to two hours. So a, lo- a lot of times what folks will do during the marathon is they'll have, if you look at the bottom of this chart that's on your screen, they'll have a packet of you can 30 minutes prior to the race. Um, and then they'll dose roughly every 75 to 90 minutes. And here, here's one thing that's important to consider and why you want to train with the product. If you're training with UCAN and you say that one serving that I take prior to, to my run lasts me two hours, then if you're going longer than two hours, you want to take that next serving 
about 20 to 30 minutes before you need it. Because remember, when, when you take a gel, the idea is that it's a rapid delivery of energy. You're taking it and boom, three to four minutes later, it's going to hit you and you're going to get that rush. With you can, because it's a little bit slower of a breakdown, you want to be ahead of the game when you fuel. So in training, if you find out that whatever that serving is lasts you, you know, X amount of time, let's, let's again, let's just say two hours, then you want to take every subsequent serving during your run 90 minutes. So every 90 minutes, so it has enough time to kick in. So, uh, you know, the average marathoner, we have people, they'll take a packet before, they'll take a, a pack, uh, between a half and a full packet, depending on the individual, they'll take that amount around mile 10, they'll do the same thing around mile 17, and that's all they need. Um, now there, if you know, the way in terms of carrying it, we, we already uh, alluded to the fact that you can mix it with as much or as little water as you'd like. Um, so a lot of times what people do to make it more convenient to carry is they'll just carry it in a very small gel flask, a four ounce gel flask and, um, mix it up very thick into a paste. And so they'll take their, you can gel at mile 10 their you can gel at mile 17. We are certainly working on, on a more portable and more convenient product format, but for now, that's kind of the way that people who want to fuel exclusively with UCAN have gotten around it. Uh, what have you done, Michelle? When you've used UCAN during your race, what, what have you done? And then also uh, before you leave, if you want to just weigh in on um, the idea of using gels and UCAN together. Sure. Um, so for the Seattle Marathon, when I, when I run a half marathon, I just take um, like basically one packet or like one and a half scoops if you're using the tub. Um, about 45 minutes, but between like 30 and 45 minutes before. And that's, that's all I'll have. Cause I'm going to be running my half marathon, um, you know, in about a little over 80 minutes. So, you know, if you're going beyond that, you might want to take about two scoops before, but I found I don't need to redose at all during a half marathon. And the first time I tried to run a half marathon, um, without using gels or goo that took my, you can before. And I actually, I brought a goo with me just because I was, I was nervous. Like I've never, I've never run that long, like raced that long without having to redo. So I do want, you know, everybody that's on here, that's listening. Like I, we, I realize this is, this is totally different than everything you've experienced that you've been taught. This is really exciting stuff. Not only are you not going to have to redose, you're going to feel a million times better than when your body's dependent on sugar. This is really exciting stuff, but I definitely realized that, um, this can, this is kind of like blowing your mind. This is new stuff. Um, but what, when I ran the Seattle Marathon, I took uh, two packets of the UCAN before, and I actually added my own whey protein. I took a little bit of whey protein because, as Warren was talking about, you know, the, the super starch is going to keep your, your blood sugar really stable. So it's going to keep, um, you know, your brain really stable. But the protein uh, feeds the hunger in your stomach. So usually if I'm running more than about two hours, I like to have a little bit of protein. And I didn't need to redose until mile. Um, I had my girlfriend meet me between mile 16 and 17 with just one scoop of um, one scoop of the you can so I ran the entire marathon I didn't I mean that's what I ate before or consumed I guess you could say because I drank it before was there's two packets plus um, a little bit of whey protein and then between mile 16 and 17 my girlfriend met me with another scoop so in total it ended up being about um, I think about 350 to 400 calories throughout the whole marathon and uh, you know, I ran that. That was my PR, the 308.26, and it's a pretty tough Seattle course. It's definitely a tough uh, second half of the course. So it was just, it was awesome to be able to have energy throughout the entire race. I actually was able to negative split, um, which was my first time doing that in a marathon. It was the first time I'd used solely you can in a marathon. Um, and then just to kind of talk a little about using um, you can in gels. Um, you know, the problem with using a gel, you know, and anytime you use a gel, you're going to spike your blood sugar, at least to some degree. You know, when you're running, you're not going to be spiking as much as if you're just sitting there because there's different processes going on in our body when we're exercising. But, um, you know, what, what we've found that you're, you know, you're better off if you're able to keep your blood sugar stable using the UCAN before and this to keep using the UCAN during. Um, if you're somebody who's like, oh, I really, I've been training with the gels, I really want to use the gels. Um, especially towards the end of the race, it's not going to make as big of a difference, you know, when you only have uh, 20 or 30 minutes to run. But I've, you know, I've known people that have um, used UCAN and have trained with it. And then, you know, when they start to run the race, you know, if you start to use those gels, you're, you're at a risk of crashing your blood sugar, you know, because UCAN is not designed to get your blood sugar up. It's designed to keep your blood sugar stable. So let's say you start out with stable blood sugar using UCAN, and then you take a gel. Now you've kind of spiked your blood sugar. And then when you start to crash, 
you know, you, if you use Ducan again, it's not really going to bring you back up. So that's the problem with using gels during. And, you know, some people have, um, you know, I've known people that get really nervous and they may have a gel towards the end of a race and that, that seems to be okay. Or people sip on a little Gatorade, you know, at the aid stations, you know, you can just blunt some of the effects of um, those higher glycemic carbohydrates, but it really can put a, put a dent in your performance if you, you know, crash your blood sugar. Well, Michelle, just want to, we'll let you get out uh, of here, but I really appreciate your feedback. Uh, great perspective. And, and like I said, everybody, I'm going to stick around and answer, uh, you know, Lori, Shannon, James, Tom, Gina, Anthony, Angela, I see all your questions. So don't worry. And a lot of these are, um, you know, relatively similar questions. So we're, uh, we're going to uh, rip through all these, but uh, thanks a lot, Michelle. We'll talk to you again soon. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. I'll touch base with you later. All right, great. Um, so I think one thing to add with, um, you know, with Michelle to Michelle's perspective is I certainly understand that some of you just don't want to mess around with carrying anything during your race, you know, maybe okay in training, but, but not during your race. So for, for you, there's a couple of options. Um, if you want to just start off by taking the one packet of you can prior to your run, um, for a lot of people that may last them 10 to 12 miles. And then you can switch over if you want to the gels, you know, so, so around, you know, 90 minutes into the race, start fluing with your gels and, and use your gel protocol. If, if you just don't want to carry anything, I totally understand that. And that's perfectly fine. What you don't want to do is, you know, take you can before the race and follow your normal gel protocol every 30 minutes, you know, because then, you know, I would, I would tell you in that situation, you might as well not have taken the you can, you know, there was, there was no point. So allow you can to, to run its course and then switch over to the gels. Similarly, uh, and, and somebody asked me, you know, is it okay to double the dose um, of you can take two packets or, or even more um, prior to the race? So absolutely, there, there's no harm at all in doing that. Of course, I would say plan to train with it. But we have many folks that, that find that, you know, if a packet of you can lasts them about 90 minutes, doubling that dose, taking two packets um, prior to the race will actually, you know, get them two and a half hours. Um, so for some people, you know, that's it'll get them through 16 miles for some people it'll get them through 20 miles. And then again, you know, then you have the same option. You either at that point, you know, drink the Gatorade on the course, have the gels, or if, if you don't mind carrying, you can then basically, uh, you know, what you've done is, uh, put yourself in a situation where all you have to do is refuel one time during the marathon. You have your two pack of the, you can before, and then you have, you know, your, your additional serving of you can between mile 18 and 20 and, and you're all set. You're good to go. So a lot of people really love that aspect of it. I know plenty of people that have taken three packets. I mean, for some people, you know, depending, it, it really is unique to the individual. Depends on how long you're out there. Depends on how intense your effort is. But I've had people take two packets of you can prior to a marathon and that's all they need. Just water. I've had some people say, I'm going to take three packets of you can prior to a marathon. And again, that's all they need. They'll just drink water on the course. So, you know, in terms of taking multiple d servings, um, play around with it in your training. See if taking the doubling or tripling that serving, see how much of a difference it actually makes for you. And then, um, you know, decide uh, whether or not you feel like it's worthwhile. Uh, for some folks also, you know, that idea of, of tasting something, of refueling during the run does have an appeal. So they like to have some flavor just mentally uh, during the run. So I kind of uh, say whatever works best for you. And when you're taking multiple packets um, before the race, you know, you don't, you don't have to maintain that eight to 12 ounce ratio per packet. You know, I mean, I, I would guess a lot of you don't want to take in, you know, 30 ounces of water before running. So you could just mix it really, really thick, almost into like a pudding or a paste, or you could stagger the doses. So what some folks will do is they'll drink the you can with protein, you know, an hour and a half before the race is, is their breakfast. And then they'll drink either that one or two servings of you can without protein 30 minutes before the race. So play around with that, experiment with it. But for all of you that were asking that question, it's certainly okay to take multiple doses. Uh, Shannon um, asks, uh, you know, if you use this a lot, the tubs are more economical. Why are the scoop servings smaller than the packet? Can you talk about serving difference? Shannon, terrific question. Um, so uh, I'll, so I'll first just uh, define the difference in servings. Um, one packet is roughly equal to one and a half scoops. So, uh, you know, most people start with the, the packets, but then they, they move on to the tubs. So if you train with the packets and then you say, okay, I really like this, I want to train with it, just keep that in mind. You know, if, if you know how much energy you get off the packet, then just make sure that, that you've kind of got that ratio in mind. In, in terms of the serving size, the reason we made it different is because what we found was that a, a lot of people wanted to use UCAN because 
they wanted to use it for their 45 minute run or their, their one hour run. And, uh, you know, really what they found is that they didn't need that full packet when they were exercising less than an hour, they still wanted to feel very steady, you know? And so they loved that, that feeling that they got from you can. So, um, you know, the packets originally were created for endurance athletes who, who we uh, figured would be out there for a longer period of time. But then we started understanding that, Hey, people aren't just using this for their long runs. You know, they're using this to maintain their blood sugar and burn more fat during their shorter workouts, or they're using this to maintain their energy just a, a, a little amount during their shorter workouts. So that, that was really the idea of the serving size. It was, it was a convenience issue. And uh, regarding the cost, Shannon, um, if you actually, uh, we've done the math on this and we've had customers do the math. If you break it down to the cost per gram, it's virtually the same. So, um, you know, at this point, the, the difference between packets and tubs is much more of a, a format and a convenience issue, um, not a cost issue. So I know the, that it's natural for people to assume the tubs are more economical, but it's actually, um, you know, it's, it's much more just about what format you prefer. And, and, you know, if you want it to be portable, if you want to be able to take packets with you to a race, let's see, uh, Lori wonders, um, any benefits to using protein pre-workout workout versus the sports drink mix? I've tried both and actually like the protein version better. Uh, so Lori, I think, um, good question. We, I think we touched on this a little bit earlier, but simply the only benefit to using you can with protein prior to the race would be if, or, or prior to a, a workout is, you know, if you're somebody that gets hungry, during the workout, the protein is designed to prevent hunger. And, and overall, if you're somebody, you know, a lot of runners uh, lack um, enough protein in their diet. Uh, you know, we've always been conditioned to think that you need this protein within that 30-minute window after you recover. But, but there's a lot of new research in the last couple of years that's come out that it's really, you know, in terms of contributing to recovery, it's more about your 10 to 12-hour protein intake because you're not, that, that protein isn't you know, repairing your muscles immediately after you take it. You know, there's a process that protein has to go through and, and it has to break down before it can actually contribute to muscle recovery. So, um, you know, it, some people view the you can protein with protein. Um, if they're a little bit deficient in protein in their diet, they feel like, hey, this is a way for me to get in some extra protein and start the recovery period earlier. So if you've been using the protein and like the protein version better, whether it's because of flavor or, or how it kind of, um, keeps you satiated, um, by all means, keep on using the protein. It's no problem at all. Uh, let's see. James says, um, okay, James, this is your question. If running a 430 marathon, is there any advantage or disadvantage to taking two packets before the start? I think we just talked about that. Absolutely no disadvantage. Uh, the advantage would be that it lasts you, it will last you longer. Um, and ultimately how much longer it lasts you will help you make that decision about whether or not, to, not it's worth it. And, you know, again, you do want to test it out in training because you just want to make sure that um, you, that the, you know, the consistency that you're going to take two packets at is something that's agreeable for you in terms of taste. And you want to also make sure that if you are using, you know, a lot of water that you kind of figure out the timing of it uh, in terms of needing to use the bathroom or, or how much water will, will kind of make you feel sloshy or, or bloated. But, but again, remember the amount of water you use is totally just personal preference. Tom wants to know um, the amount of time needed to wean off gels and gain full benefits of UCAN. Tom, great question. Um, so, you know, if you're a chronic uh, gel user, it might take you, you know, a week or two to, to, for your body to get used to UCAN. You, you'll certainly uh, still feel an effect from it the first time um, that, you, that you use it. But like Michelle said, you know, when you're using it initially, if you've been training with gels, I always recommend to keep a gel or two, um, depending on how long you're going in your pocket as a backup, because then, you know, a, a lot of it's even mental, you know, you don't want to, if, if you've, you've trained with gels and you're switching to, you can, and, um, you're kind of nervous the whole run, if, if it's going to last you the, the whole time, you're not going to perform to the level you want to. So it's, it's a, um, it's a great insurance plan to just to keep whatever traditional fuel you've been using in your pocket in case you run into a situation where you need it. Um, in general, I would say that most people, um, you know, once they use UCAN three, four, five times, um, their their body uh, starts to adapt to it, and and they pretty much are able, from an energy standpoint, to get the full benefits of it. In terms of fat burning, that's very uh, like a lot of things in nutrition. It's very unique to the individual. Uh, people who are eating less sugar and um, you know maybe consuming less fast acting carbs in their overall diet are generally just better fat burners in general. So those folks might just get kind of like a ridiculous effect from you can where I've had people tell me they take a packet and if they're eating very low carb or, um, you know, really great fat burners, uh, they find that 
a packet of UCAN will last them three hours. Uh, but so that 90 minute is kind of a recommendation that we give us uh, in terms of how long it'll last you is kind of for that average person, you know, eating a fairly standard uh, diet. But, um, you know, I, I think if, if you want to commit to training with UCAN, all I would say is that initially, if you're going for a long time, you might just want to either um, shorten the frequency of, of dosing. So, you know, whereas if you've trained with it for a while, you might only need a serving every 90 minutes or two hours, you might initially want to take a, a serving of UCAN every hour. Um, if, if you find that, you know, that you need a little bit more initially as you wean off the gels, or you may find that you just want to use a little bit more of it. So, you know, you might want to use, uh, let's, let's talk in terms of scoops. You know, if you were going to just use one scoop for a one hour run, you might want to use a scoop and a half for a one hour run initially. Um, so take some time to play around with, but by no means is it a, a two or three month adjustment period. You know, you'll use it a couple of times and you'll get acclimated to it very quickly. Um, and then Tom, um, how about a caffeinated version of you can? So it, it's, it's certainly something we've, we've thought about Tom right now. What a lot of people are doing is, um, they're just mixing, uh, like our chocolate or vanilla protein, you can with some, with some iced coffee. I mean, I'll do that oftentimes as breakfast, you know, maybe an hour before, um, I run, if I want a little, if it's in the morning and I want that caffeine boost, uh, for whatever reason, uh, like Michelle said, there's no, uh, there's no issue at all mixing caffeine with you can. So we don't have our own caffeinated version yet. It's something we're considering, but in the meantime, if you want to mix coffee with you can, um, I know a lot of people that do that and it works great. Let's see, Gina, um, can it be put in a blender? Will the efficacy remain if mixed early and consumed, um, after two or three hours? Uh, good, very good question, Gina. We didn't address this yet. Uh, so absolutely it can be put in a blender if, if you, um, you know, want a little bit of a, a smoother, um, consistency, then a lot of people will mix it in a blender in terms of pre-mixing it. Um, up to 48 hours before is no problem. So a lot of folks, um, you know, myself included, if I'm running in the morning, you know, like any powder, you can taste a heck of a lot better when it's cold. I'll mix it the night before, keep it in the fridge and then, um, and then have it in the morning before I run. Um, so that's no issue at all. And then even like, you know, triathletes or ultra runners who are out there for 10, 12, 15 hours. I mean, they're, they're in a lot of cases pre-mixing their, you can, and then having it three, four hours into the race. So, um, absolutely no problem pre-mixing it and, um, you know, it'll hold up. It, it, the, the one thing is, you know, if you do pre-mix it, um, there may be a little bit of a settling, um, effect if, if you've wait, waited a couple hours. So I would just recommend if you've pre-mixed it, just give it a little bit of a shake before, uh, before you drink it, but it, it won't spoil or, or anything like that. Anthony asks, um, if one packet is good for a two hour run, how do you feel for a run longer than two hours? Um, so I think Anthony, we've kind of touched on that um, here. Hopefully, uh, we did answer that question for you. Please do uh, type something in here if uh, if you need a little bit more clarification. But you know, just at a very general level, um, a packet roughly every seventy five to ninety minutes, or or you know, it may not even need to be a full packet. It could be like you know half a packet or or two thirds of a packet, uh, roughly every seventy five to ninety minutes if you're going longer, or you could try to use, uh, double up that serving and take the two packets before. Angela asks, is it okay to drink Gatorade during the run with you can, or should you drink water only? So, you know, Angela, I think it's the same thing that applies with the gel. Um, you certainly don't want to be pounding Gatorade consistently, uh, throughout the run because it's going to throw off this steady blood sugar that you can offers. But, you know, if you're sipping on a tiny bit of Gatorade, you know, every third or fourth, uh, aid station, or, you know, just having, uh, just, the, you know, two ounces of Gatorade, it's, it's not going to make a huge difference. It's not going to be the end of the world at all. So, um, you know, just don't follow, I guess, don't follow your normal, um, Gatorade protocol. If when you're using, you can, you know, try to limit the amount of it that you'll consume at a very general level. We say roughly, um, you should try to keep your sugar intake below about five to six grams an hour when um, you're using UCAN to get the full benefits out of UCAN. So, you know, try to keep that in mind. If you're sipping a little bit of Gatorade here and there, it's not going to, it's not going to hurt you that much. But, um, but you know, the, the thing is you may very well find that you just don't need it, which is what most people tell us, you know, that's, that's the big thing. They just don't have that desire to get that, that sugar spike. Let's see, Michael wants to know if someone is planning on running under five hour marathon, how much or how often would they fuel using you can? So uh, yeah, again, Michael, I think it's probably, it's quite similar, you know, the, the intervals, um, between fueling with you can is generally 
you know, about 75 to 90 minutes. And, and, you know, I guess you would just be doing it more frequently if you were running a, a, a roughly a five hour marathon. So, you know, you, you do it at the beginning, you might do it an hour and 15 minutes to an hour and a half in again, around the three hour mark. And then, um, you know, if you need it, maybe again, around uh four fifteen or so just, uh, to carry you through the end of the race. One thing to mention is that when you're fueling with you can during your race, you, you want to try to get it in your system, you know, over a relatively short period of time. So you want to, you want to consume the you can over about a, uh, 15 to 15 minute span, a 10 to 15 minute span tops. You know, you're not sipping on it over the course of, um, 45 minutes or an hour that that's in general, the way we found the product works best. Now we have some people, um, for example, who just like to fuel more frequently just because it's what they're used to. And, and for those folks, they may take a packet of you can and have it, um, you know, in their flask or in their bottle. And they may, um, they may drink like a third of that packet every 20 minutes. And then that, that's fine too. You know, that works. If you prefer not to, to consume as much at once. And if you like the idea of just fueling at more frequent intervals, then you can certainly, uh, certainly do that. But, you know, I would, if, if you are going to not consume it all at once, I would definitely recommend consuming like a substantial amount, um, at shorter intervals versus just, you know, consuming like a, a very tiny sip, because, you know, for those of you who have tried, you can, you'll understand this, the consistency is a little bit thicker. So, you know, nursing it slowly, like a noon or an electrolyte drink, it's not going to, really, even though it's mixed with water, you're not going to necessarily feel refreshed from it. So you probably wouldn't even enjoy it as much consuming it, you know, sip by sip by sip over, over an hour. So that's, that's part of the thing too. You know, you can is really your fuel source, not your hydration, even though it's something you're mixing with water. Uh, Angela asks, can, should you carry, you can during race instead of water and sip throughout? All right, Angela, well, that's good. I think we just, uh, we just alluded to that. Um, you know, you can, even though like, again, I, I just want to reiterate this, even though you can is mixed with water, it's not necessarily a replacement for hydration. Uh, for a lot of folks, it'll help them stay hydrated and it's all the hydration you need. But, um, you know, if you're thirsty, you should never feel like, oh, I drank my you can, I don't need to drink any more water. You know, that's, that's very kind of in, unique to the individual, but um, you can certainly just continue to drink water along with you can uh, during the race. Um, wow. I think, uh, we finally almost got to the end of these, uh, Karen and Tom asked the same question, which is, uh, are these slides available after, after the webinar? And, and yeah, absolutely guys. So after this webinar, you know, everybody will, um, later tonight be getting an email from me, um, with uh, full recording of this webinar. But if you want the slides as well, I'm more than happy to send them to you. Feel free to just um, reply to that email that you get from me and, and let me know that you want the slides and I, I've got no issue at all sending them to you. So they'll definitely be available. Um, with that, I think we might be done here. Um, so just, you know, in summary, uh, I really just love, um, love when you guys, uh, are, are participating so much. I mean, this is, this is valuable for us because all, of all these great questions, you know, it's really fascinating to hear the questions that people have and, a lot of terrific questions. So I, I hope you were all able to, to get um, a lot out of this. And um, like I mentioned, you know, we will be sending uh, samples for, for everybody who joined on this, joined in on this webinar. And, um, you know, Deb uh, will have all your names that were here today. So um, by Friday, if you guys just plan to, uh, you know, anytime after Friday, go into Fleet Feed and, um, you know, let her know that you were on the webinar or give her your name, uh, then you will get that free sample packet of you can. And, I know Deb has used the product herself, um, you know, with good success. So she'll be a tremendous resource um, for you guys to answer any of your questions about using it. But, um, you know, you can certainly, everybody's going to have my email. So, uh, you know, the, the conversation doesn't end today. I mean, feel free anytime if you have, you know, specific questions as you start to train with the product or, or you know, kind of something we didn't hit on today or, or questions that are very unique to your circumstances. Um, please do feel free to email me. I'm more than happy to chat with you on the phone, chat with you via email. Um, so, you know, we really are, are invested in, in making you can work for you and, and helping you have the most success with it as possible. Um, so with that being said, uh, I guess you guys must be sick of my voice at, at this point, <laughs> but really want to thank everybody. want to thank Fleet Feet Pittsburgh again for putting this together. We had a, a phenomenal group um, here in the house today. So uh, really appreciate you guys and really appreciate Fleet Feet doing this um, with us tonight. I know Michelle had a great time too. So um, thanks everybody. We uh, look forward to keeping in touch and um, 
like again, just to reiterate, you will get a recording. You'll be able to pick up a sample and feel free to contact me at any time. Thanks a lot, everybody. Have a great night and look forward to your continued feedback as you are able to train more with UCAN. Thank you so much.